the phenom. They're the sports world equivalent of the elixir of life, the stuff dreams are made of. The phenom truly does get scouts drooling and fans waiting anxiously for their arrival. Their stories haven't been written yet, so anything seems possible. Sometimes the phenom turns into Ken Griffey Jr., a Hall of Famer, and sometimes they turn into Brian Taylor, who never pitched even an inning in the majors. Both were number one picks coming out of high school. One made it, one didn't. But perhaps no phenom in the history of the sport can rival the epic majesty of a young Bryce Harper. It's hard to imagine any 16 year old equaling Harper's physical prowess, his mental toughness, or his unshakable confidence. You can make a pretty compelling case he's the best high school player the game has ever seen, or ever will see. And nothing showcases those qualities of Harper's more than the season he spent playing for the College of Southern Nevada, where over 66 games he hit 443 with 31 home runs and 98 RBIs. He managed to swipe 20 bags as well, and even pitched, reaching up to 98 miles per hour on his four-seamer. He even led his team to the Junior College World Series. Oh yeah, and this was all when he should have been just a junior in high school. Most high schoolers at that age don't know what college they'll be attending, or what career they'll have, or even how to rent a tux for the prom. The real world seems very far away, and most teens are understandably in no hurry to get there. Athletes in particular can undergo drastic growth spurts, or suffer devastating injuries that can alter future plans. There are no guarantees when you're 16. Scouting these phenoms is especially risky, because even among first round draft picks, only two out of three ever make it to the show, and even fewer have a significant impact. Among the elite, the numbers say that each pick has less than a 50% chance of making an all-star team. Of the 58 players drafted first since 1965, just three have been elected to the Hall of Fame. This is to say there are truly no sure things in scouting, except when it came to the young Bryce Harper. Scouts, opposing players, and even Harper himself all were positive that the random processes and built-in biases that ruled the universe didn't apply to him. He was Can't Miss in capital letters, a generational talent who would maybe be the first 18 year old since Robin Yunt in 1974 to hit a homer in an MLB game. Harper wanted to be the best hitter in the history of baseball, a goal he'd worked towards pretty much since he started playing t-ball at the age of three. And while he hasn't quite lived up to that standard since debuting in the bigs, he has consistently ranked among the best of his generation. Still, with all that having been said, let nobody ever forget that for a summer season in 2010, Bryce Harper was perhaps the most dominant baseball player on the planet. But before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, Underdog Fantasy, and how you can get involved with your favorite teams and players every single day. In any of the major sports, including MLB, NHL, NFL, and NBA. With Underdog's Pick'em, you choose between the over or under on a multitude of daily available stats, ranging from strikeouts, hits, touchdowns, passing yards, even their individualized fantasy points. Then you simply select two to five picks, and if your picks are correct, you can win anywhere from three to 20 times your initial entry amount. Or if those stakes are a little too high for you, you can always go with their insurance system, which allows you to get one pick incorrect in exchange for a lower multiplier. Overall, I think it's a great way to have some fun with your favorite sports and maybe make a little money while you're doing Doing it. Getting started is simple. Go to underdog.com and sign up with promo code MTC. As of right now, they're matching initial deposits up to $500. Again, that's underdogfantasy.com with promo code MTC to see them match your initial deposit up to $500. Now, back to our video. There's a Paul Bunyan quality to the early life of Bryce Harper, a combo of legend and fairy tale that only his hometown of Las Vegas can produce. Bryce's father, Ron, put three-year-old Bryce on the same t-ball team as his older brother, Brian, who was six. That trend continued with Harper playing up at virtually every stage of his baseball career. Brian was a big athletic pitcher, and so he played up too, meaning that when Harper was seven, he was playing with 11 and 12 year olds, and was more than holding his own. By the time he was nine, travel ball teams from several states were calling the Harpers, offering plane tickets and hotel rooms for the fourth grader to come play in tournaments all over the country. This continued for the next six years, with Harper playing between 80 and 130 games per season. At one tournament in Alabama, playing on a field with 250 foot fences, Harper went 12 for 12 with 11 home runs. Yeah, you heard me right, 11 homers. But that's probably because he was already taking BP on the field of the College of Southern Nevada, where as a 12 year old using a wooden bat, he once allegedly bombed five straight homers over 400 feet. For context, 12 is the age of most of the players in the Little League World Series. By then, Harper was already going yards on fields used by adults, and he hadn't even started seventh grade. Harper's appetite for the game was voracious. He'd come home from a tournament, and within an hour, he'd be asking his 
his dad to go hit. He couldn't get enough of baseball. His work ethic was off the charts. He was pushing himself constantly and loving every minute of it. He maintained his grades at school and continued his study of Mormon theology. While he did play on some of the same Las Vegas teams as future big leaguers Joey Gallo and Chris Bryant, Harper was on many teams at the same time. Each summer, he'd fly to Orlando, then to Oklahoma. Then he'd be off to California, then to Yankee Stadium for a showcase, then to Fenway for another. As Gallo said, he was the biggest and strongest player his age, reaching 6 foot 3 and 205 pounds by his freshman year of high school. By then he was already a legend, touching upper 80s from the mound, routinely hitting 400 foot plus dingers, and playing excellent defense wherever he was placed in the field. His favorite position was catcher, where he could throw out base runners from his knees. The common expression, he was a man amongst boys, pretty much sums up Harper's athletic experience during his adolescence. Bryce attended Las Vegas High School, becoming yet another star the city has produced. The best Vegas player is pitcher Greg Maddox, who barely stood 6 feet tall and hardly could throw 90 miles per hour. But he won 355 big league games with one of the best changeups in baseball history and otherworldly control. In many ways, Maddox is the opposite of Harper. Greg was overlooked, considered too small, and even when he made it, used deception and guile to baffle hitters rather than raw power. Funny enough, one of his high school strikeout victims was Ron Harper, Bryce's dad. This was a far cry from the man-child-like dominance of young Bryce. Maddox honed his craft from Sunday afternoon workouts, where the city's best players would gather, establishing a kind of Las Vegas hardball fraternity that still exists. Harper is the logical extension of the city's love of baseball that began long before his birth. In some ways, Vegas was the perfect city for Harper. Its airports fly to every city in the country, its youth leagues are stocked with talent, indoor batting cages are abundant, and to top it all off, most of the greats like Maddox stayed in the area and helped keep the traditions alive through mentoring and coaching. There was no question that travel ball had prepared Harper for high school baseball. His skipper, Sam Thomas, a 30-year coaching vet, had never seen anything like him. He couldn't coach him on hitting. He was set. His physical development had him looking like a grown man already. But above all, it was his will to win that really stood out for Thomas. Like few peers in his age group, Harper cared more about winning than he did his own stats. He was, in essence, the perfect player. His resulting stats were something else. As a freshman, he boasted a batting average of 599 with 11 homers and 67 RBI in 38 games. But there was one homer in particular that still lives on in local legend to this day, as apparently, the blast had went 570 feet out of the park he was playing in, over some trees and across an elevated five lane road, landing with a thud in the desert. Harper was 15 at the time, and probably the only 15 year old who could do anything like that on the planet. That summer, Harper was the MVP of the 16U national team, leading them to an 8-0 record while hitting 571 with four homers. But he was just getting started. In January, he went to Tropicana Field, which was hosting the International Power Showcase. There, in what became a viral sensation, Harper, with an aluminum bat, crushed a ball 502 feet, knocking it against the outer wall of the dome, one of five straight bombs. Even Yankees pitcher Andy Pettit was impressed after his kids showed him the video. Soon though, the entire world would know of Harper, because in June 2009, he landed on the cover of Sports Illustrated, where he was dubbed the Chosen One in a play on a previous cover that had depicted LeBron James. It made sense. Harper's sophomore year saw him name the National High School Player of the Year, as he hit an insane 626 with 14 homers and 55 RBIs. He was also throwing mid-90s from the bump. But players on other teams resented him, and there were incidents where Harper got targeted with verbal abuse and even worse, a risk of injury. High school baseball was no longer a healthy place for him. Just like LeBron, Harper also faced some big decisions about his future. High school baseball didn't offer him the competition he needed to get better, but he didn't really have any options, or so it seemed. He had to play at least two more seasons before he could become draft eligible. Or did he? His mother Sherry was scrolling through the comments section of an online article about her son when she came across a crazy idea from one post. If Bryce dropped out of high school and waited a year, he could become draft eligible a year earlier. But how could he play baseball? And what about his education? A plan quickly formed. Bryce could take a GED to take care of his educational requirements and then enter the College of Southern Nevada where he could take classes and play some baseball. Today, thousands of dual enrollment kids take JUCO classes while in high school, but it wasn't very prevalent then, especially when considering the sports playing aspect. And so, the concept seemed a bit shocking, and wasn't even a good idea to begin with. The Harpers picked CSN because it was down the street. The team played in a wood bat league, and Harper's brother was transferring back home from Cal State Northridge, where he could serve as Bryce's chaperone of sorts. 
Plus, the team was loaded with talented Vegas players, and Bryce knew almost all of them, some for many years. It was a tight-knit, hard-working group that would see six players get drafted that June. They had one goal, to win it all. They welcomed Mondo, as Harper was called, with open arms. Before beginning his season at CSN, Harper had some business to take care of, being the youngest player on the National 18U team. A squad that also featured Manny Machado, Nick Castellanos, Jameson Talion, Robbie Ray, and Kevin Gossman. Harper hit 294 with two bombs, and the team didn't lose even a single game, blowing out everyone it played. But the conditions in Venezuela were difficult, and when Harper reported to CSN, he dropped 15 pounds. He'd been playing baseball all summer without a break after all. When he faced the college pitchers on his own team, many of which would end up making it to the big leagues or AAA, he was overmatched for the first time in his life. The manager, Tim Chambers, made Harper take a couple days off. By the time they began scrimmaging other teams, Harper was back, and it was then he started going off. Like, really off. The 2009 season began with a game against Arizona Western College, and thus also began the habit of the opposing team stopping everything to watch Harper take BP. That perhaps explains why when he came up with the runner at third, they tried to intentionally walk him. But Harper didn't leave high school early to get walked. Instead, he swung at a pitch that was in the right-handed batter's box and sent it out to deep left, scoring the runner on a sacrifice fly. A few weeks later, CSN played against Cypress College, a California school, and a non-conference opponent that used metal bats. So, Harper used a metal bat, which is a bit of a dangerous concept in retrospect. The wind was blowing out to left, and instead of using his usual open stance, Harper went with a closed stance so he could aim to launch a ball to left. Most players can't change their stance like that in a real game with talented pitchers on the fly, but Harper wasn't like most players, and smacked a dinger to left. CSN won 13 out of their first 16 games, but it was a contest in March at the College of Southern Idaho that displayed the kind of tenacity Harper showed off during the season. For some insane reason, the bullpen had a concrete fence around it that stood about 5 inches high, and playing right field, Harper went racing after a foul ball down the line. At full speed, Bryce slid into this concrete wall to make the catch. It was a risky play that could have led to serious injury and the potential loss of millions in a signing bonus, but Harper never slowed down. Every CSN teammate had said the same thing about Bryce. He gave 100% all the time, on the field, in the cages, and in the weight room. He did leg workouts so grueling that he couldn't drive home. If he had a game off, he'd hit in the cage with his dad, swing after swing after swing, a preview of their unforgettable home run derby victory in 2018. From right field, he liked to throw behind runners taking a wide turn after a single. When he himself hit a single, it often became a double because of how hard Harper busted out of the box. On deck, he'd tell teammates, watch this, I'm gonna get him, watch. And then he'd go up and atomize the baseball, sometimes 450 plus feet. All of this at 16 years old, remember. But CSN's season almost ended prematurely because to qualify for the JUCO World Series, they needed to win its regional in a true double elimination tournament. But they lost the first game to Central Arizona College 21 to 14, meaning that another loss would knock them out completely. That second game became legendary. Harper went 6 for 6 with 4 homers, a double, and a triple, leading his team to a 25 to 11 route and earning the team a trip to the Junior College World Series in Grand Junction, Colorado. He finished the regular season slashing 442, 524, 986, with 29 home runs, 89 RBI, 88 runs scored, and 18 stolen bases in 62 games. But he wasn't done yet, in more ways than one. At just 17, Harper had won the Golden Spikes Award, given to the nation's best college player. It was only the second time a Juco guy had won. He'd smashed the school's home run, RBI, on base, total bases, hits, and slugging records. The team had gone 41-15 and 15 during the regular season, and had punched their ticket to play for the championship. Now, it was just a question of finishing the job. Everyone on the team must have felt as if no one could beat them. Not only did they have the first pick of the draft, there were seven other players who'd get drafted and play professionally. They romped through the first three games, never breaking a sweat. But a big threat loomed, the San Jacinto College Ravens from outside Houston, which had sent luminaries like Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, Lucas Litke, Anthony Banda, and countless others to the show. They'd also won five national titles. The winner of this game, it was thought, would be in the driver's seat to win it all. But for Bryce Harper, this game would end up standing out for different reasons. All season, Harper had been dealing with more fame and adulation than perhaps any amateur player ever had, and with that, more pressure than anyone else as well. Despite this, he'd handle all the distractions without any trouble. Incredible for someone so young. 
Then came the infamous game, as he usually did when catching, Harper exchanged pleasantries with the umpire and let him know what his pitcher threw. The umpire, however, cut him off mid-sentence, saying, I heard you can hit, let's see if you can catch. It was obvious the guy wasn't a fan. This was a bad omen, and one Harper didn't necessarily heed, because later, when he held a close pitch the umpire had called a ball, the ump jumped all over Bryce. From this point on, Harper needed to avoid any confrontation with the guy who obviously wanted to take him down a few notches. But alas, he failed to stand down. When he came to the plate, the umpire rang him up on a pitch that was a mile outside. He never said a word. Instead, on his way back to the dugout, he used his bat to draw a line in the dirt where the pitch had been. Big mistake, he was immediately tossed. With the nation's best player now relegated to the bench, staring blankly off into space, his team lost 10-8. Perhaps even worse, because he was ejected, Harper had to sit out the next game too, which CSN lost 9-8 on a walk-off homer. Season over, just like that. Unfortunately for Mondo, all the gaudy numbers in the world couldn't add up to a title. Now, thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and click this playlist for other essay content just like this. Have a great day everyone.